This is the Lotpreneur 7 bomb sight. Many of you are aware that the Norden bomb sight was the nation's second most highly guarded World War II secret after the atomic bomb. However, many people are not aware that one of Carl Norden's employees in New York, Herman Lang, was actually a German spy. And he gave the plans for the Norden bomb site to the Germans in 1937. He did not actually give them blueprints, but described from memory how the device worked. Some of the technologies from the Norden bomb site were then incorporated into the Lotfrenor 7 bomb site, also known as the Lotfi 7 bomb site. I cannot completely vouch for the accuracy of the information in this video as I was unable to find any videos of the device actually being used other than one very grainy World War II video with no sound. And although I have several manuals describing the operation of the device, they are all in German which I cannot read. However, I believe I have an accurate enough understanding of the bomb site to provide a description of its function and use. From the top, we see the eyepiece and a metal cover that was used to cover it when not in use. Here we have a switch which controls the gyroscopically stabilized crosshairs and lighting mechanism for that. This is the ground speed indicator which was set with this knob here. And this is the trail mechanism and a circuit breaker which will interrupt all function. If the bombardier was not able to use the internal optics and stabilized crosshairs to perform the bomb run, there was a manual system here which would allow the bombardier to look through and match up with these fine crosshairs and perform the bomb run without the gyroscopic stabilization. This whole mechanism here is lit and rotates along this scale. Here are where the warning lamps are. The first for an early alert of the impending bomb release and this light came on when the bombs were actually released. This controls the light to the open bomb sighting system. Over here on this side we see the sighting angle knob which adjusted the sighting angle internally, the altitude knob, and the drift knob. Finally a rheostat for the internal lighting mechanism. From what I'm able to tell the pilot actually controlled heading or azimuth during much of the approach to target. The pilot had his own drift sight which was mounted at head level and he was able to manipulate this and externally control the bomb sight drift. The bombardier also had a left-right control which could control the airplane's flight. These externally manipulated the bomb sight and controlled for drift. However, the bombardier could also manually control drift using the drift knob as we described. And in later versions, the Lot P7 was connected to an autopilot which would allow it to be controlled by the bomb sight and the bombardier's drift knob. Here you can see external control of the drift mechanism. gyroscope that controls the crosshairs. Next we'll demonstrate the trail and cross trail mechanism. Here you see it's putting in 20 degrees of drift and when we turn the trail mechanism you'll see the crosshairs shift to the right. Here you can see a further demonstration of the trail mechanism 
by adding trail into the system, it removes the beginning point of the indicator. Prior to beginning the bomb run, the bombardier would set the airspeed, and we'll set this at 300 kilometers per hour. The second thing the bombardier would do would be to set the height, and we'll set this at 5,000 meters. Next, the trail is set, and apparently this was done as a percentage of altitude or height, at about 10%. So with a height of 5,000 meters, we'll set this at 500. We'll engage the gyroscope and the internal lighting mechanism. And you can hear that warming up. But we won't turn on the drive motor here until the target is acquired. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the terms siding angle and drop angle, trail and cross trail, at the end of this video is a tutorial on the bombing problem and its solution and it will explain those terms. Our simulation is being done using a motorized treadmill with a poster of a target affixed to it. The target is going to be this smokestack which is just now coming into the crosshairs. As the target is acquired, we cut the drive motor on and it should synchronize with the target. You can see that we've drifted a little bit off to one side so we'll correct that with our drift knob. Fine adjustments are made with the siding angle. You can see the wheel at the top right rotating, showing how the dropping angle and siding angle are coming together. As you can tell, there are actually two crosshairs here, and the one that is wiggling is actually gyroscopically stabilized. And we'll tilt the bottom side a little bit to the left or right so you can see that. Now you can see the indicator starting to come in at the upper right. This alerts the bombardier that the bomb run is nearly finished. You can hear the gear shift motor shift into drive. A little bit of fine tuning with the siding angle knob. And when the two indicators meet, the bomb is released. And you hear the gear shift wind down. Here you can see the light on the open, rotating manual bombing system. And the warning light is now on as the indicator has just gotten to that point. Soon the indicators will meet and you will see the dropping indicator light up. When you see the lighting indicator drop up, you'll also hear the gear shift motor winding down. Airplanes do not drop bombs when directly over the target. The plane's airspeed is imparted to the bomb and it falls on a curved parabolic course 
similar to the second half of the arc of a ballistic missile. The Norden bomb site takes rates, speeds, times, and distances and converts these into angles to compute the release point for the bomb. Two pieces of information must be obtained from experimental test data. The first is the time of fall. Gravity causes falling objects to accelerate at 32 feet per second per second, but upward wind resistance causes the bomb to reach a terminal velocity. The shape and size of each bomb determines this wind resistance and how long it takes to fall from a given altitude. Therefore, for each bomb type, altitude, and airspeed, the bombardier looks up in a table how to set the bomb site up for this. The second piece of information relates to the fact that the airplane will always be ahead of the bomb by the time it strikes the target. The bomb is impeded by forward and upward wind resistance, so when it strikes the target, the airplane is ahead of it. The distance behind the airplane at the time of impact is called the trail, and it is also determined by testing data based on bomb type, airspeed, and altitude. It is also provided in a table. So by the time the bomb has struck the target, the airplane is out ahead of it. And the distance that the airplane is ahead of the, where the bomb strikes is called the trail, which is seen here in the orange. We can imagine a triangle with a vertical side representing the bombing altitude, as shown in the red here. If we take the ground speed times the time to fall, we know how far the airplane will travel at the time of impact. This is called the whole range, which is seen here in the blue. Again, time of fall times ground speed is how far the airplane will travel before the bomb strikes the ground, and that's called the whole range. If we subtract the trail from the whole range, we end up with the actual range, which is shown here in the green. Again, whole range minus the trail yields the actual range. This forms the base of a right triangle. Therefore, we have the bombing altitude forming the vertical side of the triangle, the actual range forming the base of the right triangle, and the hypotenuse now forms the drop angle and the bomb site computes this. There's a telescope focused on a mirror, and the mirror is run by a motor. By adjusting the speed of the motor to keep the mirror locked on the target, the bomb site is able to use this rate to compute the ground speed, and using time of fall information, can compute the whole range. Subtracting the trail from this yields the actual range, and the bomb site can then use this information to calculate the drop angle. The sight angle is the visual angle on the target. And as the airplane moves towards the target, the sight angle becomes more vertical. When the sight angle matches the drop angle, an electrical contact is made between the indicators, and the bomb is released. Pilots know that when there is a crosswind, the airplane must be angled into the wind to fly a straight path. This is known as crabbing into the wind. Although when off course, an airplane can repeatedly be turned back into the wind to get back onto course, it will be repeatedly blown off unless a corrective angle into the wind is established. The Norton bomb site has a turn knob which will allow the airplane to be turned into the wind, but it will be repeatedly blown off course unless a drift angle is established and this is done by using the turn knob and the drift knob together. This is called killing the drift. At this point the bomb site is facing the target. The airplane is flying the correct path towards the target but the airplane's nose is angled into the wind. Not only must the airplane be in angled into the wind it must be on a parallel path upwind of the target at the time of bomb release. This is because the bomb will be carried downwind by the crosswind. The distance upwind of this parallel pathway is called the cross trail. The cross trail is equal to the trail, which we have entered from the tables, times the sign of the drift angle which has been established into the wind. Therefore, setting the trail allows the bomb site to
to adjust for both trail and cross trail once the drift angle is established.